Thank you so much, and it's such a pleasure to be here today. I, I was really grateful yesterday when it was raining all day, and I thought well, people won't be distracted, and they'll have to come hear us speak. And, and today, of course, is a gorgeous day, so I have to um, thank the wisdom of the planners who scheduled uh, everything outside today. Um, you know, um, wine is such a simple thing. It's really meant to give pleasure. It's the bottom line. It can do a lot more than that, but it should never do any less. And yet, we put it up on this incredible pedestal sometimes and turn it into something really complicated. And I, I had always sense this, but I didn't really realize the, to the extent that we overcomplicate wine until I started writing about it full time in 2004. And I would run into people and, and when they learned what I did for a living, of course they would want to talk to me about wine. And it, it began to follow a pattern People would say to me, oh, I, I really like wine, but I don't know anything about it. All those aromas and flavors and the things that people talk about it, I just, I just don't get it. I guess there's something wrong with me. I guess I just don't have the, the right equipment to understand. And I heard this over and over again. People would, would seek me out to tell me their, their troubles, like I was a, a, a shrink at a cocktail party or, or a priest that they wanted to confess to. I really like wine, but I, I don't get all those aromas and flavors. And I thought, what is this, this obstacle that is getting in the way of people who are really out just to have a, enjoy this simple pleasure? Why, are, why is there an impediment to this? And so I thought I would try to um, investigate uh, American wine culture a little bit and, and try to determine what it was that was interfering with something that really ought to be simple. And so I, I started with the way people talk about wine because that's really the first thing that people say to me and it's obviously this stuff of, of popular culture, satire, um, you know, we all, we all know Frasier, the old situation comedy, when they wanted to, uh, you know, really pump up the snobbiness of the Crane brothers, they'd have them talk about wine. And um, you know the, the, the form that it takes. If you've ever read a wine consumer magazine, they're filled with tasting notes. And the text of the tasting notes is, uh, is the series of uh, aromas and flavors that, that people find in wine. The, the elderberries, the gooseberries, the cloudberries, the, the black raspberries, the black cherries, the red raspberries, uh, the, the notes of underbrush and petroleum and all the rest of it. And I don't experience wine that way. I don't, I don't drink wine with a meal. I usually, uh, when I'm drinking wine, I'm, I'm at a meal, I'm with friends, family, loved ones, maybe a business meeting, but I'm not looking at that wine and, and they always cover their ear when they get the, the notes of asparagus, like uh, Miles in, in the movie Sideways, which really uh, captured that so effectively. But nobody really talks like that. Nobody experiences wine like that, nobody I know, even the critics who are, who are writing this stuff. Why are they doing that? Why are they saying that? It's so different from the way that ordinary people experience wine that most people figure or assume that that's the experience they should be having because that's all they're reading. And when they don't experience wine that way, they find fault in themselves. I guess there's something wrong with me. And I looked at the way we, we think about wine, and so often we think about wine in terms of the 100-point scale. This is the, the accompanying number to those tasting notes, and you see those in, in the back of the magazine, too. And, uh, and of course, as Americans, we all understand the scale. 100 is great, 50 is not so good, um, 92 is better than 85. We don't have to know anything about the wine. If we see the numbers, we can 
make a decision. And I'm very sympathetic to, to the need for something to make things easier because how often have we gone into a, a wine shop and we see shelves of unfamiliar bottles with labels in, in unfamiliar languages and words that we don't understand? You see it on a restaurant wine list. And how do you decide? 92, 85, I think it's easy that way. And the problem with the 100-point scale is that it puts wine on a single universal scale of, of measurement. And wine, more than almost anything else, is, is subject to context. The 100-point scale completely ignores that. By context, I mean, where are you drinking it? Who are you drinking it with? If you're home on a weeknight and you're with your family and you're having a simple dish, wine tastes one way. If you're on vacation in the hills of Tuscany and you're with your sweetheart and you're having a wonderful dinner and the, the uh, proprietor of the inn that you're staying at brings up his homemade wine and you taste it and you're looking out at the hillside and the stars, that's the best wine you've ever had. But if you bring that wine home to your suburban dinner table somewhere and you're burdened by what's going on at work, that wine doesn't taste very good after all. How is that possible? It's the context. It depends on what you're eating, who you're with, um, your mood. Are you happy? Have you had a fight with your spouse? Are you on a romantic date? It all affects the wine. And the wine itself, if you open it, pour it in a glass, that wine is going to change. If it's a good wine, in 15 minutes, it's going to change in an hour. It's going to change in two hours. We know that wine ages in the bottle over time. It might change depending on what time of day you're opening it. And some people even say that it, it's like coffee. It depends on the barometric pressure. and You have to be very careful. That's perhaps going a little bit farther than I would go. Um, so the 100-point scale takes none of this into account. And instead, it boils every wine, or it captures every wine in a snapshot, a freeze frame for all time. This wine smells like blues, blueberries, and it's a 92. Now, understandably, if you're shopping and you buy the 92, you're confronted with an 85-point wine and a 92-point wine, you're going to choose the 92-point wine. But very often, these higher scores are awarded to wines that are meant to age, that might be tough at first, tannic, uh, need to be put away for a few years. Whereas the 85-point wine is something that's going to be fresh and easygoing and simple. So you bring home the 92-point wine to your Tuesday night meatloaf or roast chicken, and it doesn't go so well because it hasn't been aged. It's not the proper occasion. It's not the right context. And then you try that 85-point wine, and it's exactly what you're hoping for. It's delicious. But you think, 85, 92. That's not what the critics said. There must be something wrong with me. So there's almost this built-in feeling of inadequacy that comes because the way the critical establishment so often talks about wine is so at odds with the way most people experience it. And I looked at the way we learn about wine. We sometimes take wine appreciation classes. And, and to me, that's a, a loathsome term for wine. Wine appreciation. It's like it, it turns it into something genteel, an, an emblem of your civility that you would, you would wear, um, like plastic slip covers on couches or you know, a, a, a canned new car smell. Why would you want to appreciate wine? Wine is something that's really so much more soulful than that. Uh, you don't appreciate rock and roll or jazz or opera. You love it. You embrace it. Wine, you appreciate it. And why is that? Because it's something that our culture tells you you need to know something about so that you can 
operate in civilized company, like knowing what to do with the fish fork. I've, I don't know if anybody here has ever taken a wine class. Um, I have. You go to a wine class, and what do they teach you? They teach you how to sniff wine, how to taste it, and how to describe what your aromas and the aromas and flavors that you find. They teach you how to write tasting notes. They teach you how to associate the aromas and flavors with the grape. I always just look at the label. Why do you have to know how to guess what's in the glass? And there's one more problem with the way that we assess wine. The people who are giving the scores and writing these tasting notes are doing it in, in what they hope is sort of a, an objective clinical laboratory environment. They've decided that they are going to remove all information about the wine because they don't want to be influenced by, by history, heritage, prestige, wealth, power, or anything else. So all they have left is what's in the glass. And typically, wine critics are not just tasting or drinking one wine. They might come in in the morning, and they'll have 75 glasses arrayed in front of them. And they're going to do one after the other in this fluorescently lit laboratory environment. And they're going to rate that wine as if it's a vacuum cleaner or a, or a, or a car that you can time how fast it goes, zero to 60. So this wine, which changes all the time, which is alive, which can do so many things, is going to be just captured for that moment and objectified by the critic, who is left only with what's in the glass. And if they have no other information about the wine, what else are they going to write about? They're only what's in the glass, aromas and flavors. And so that's where you have your, your blueberry and your road tar and, and your fig compote and melted licorice snaps. I didn't know that licorice could melt. <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that you see. And when you put it all together, the message that the wine culture is giving us is that in order to, to understand wine, in order to have that simple pleasure, you really have to know everything about it first. You have to learn the history of vintages. You have to learn the soil that the grapes are grown in. You have to learn the different grapes. You have to learn the composition of the barrel that the wine was aged in. In short, you have to be a connoisseur before you can simply enjoy wine. And to me, this was a completely backwards formulation. Because anything that we like, we love. We have an emotional attachment to it. Um, if we want to pursue skiing, we do it. And why do we do it? Because we love it. Opera, jazz, anything. But this emotional connection is missing from wine. So that's why I called my book, How to Love Wine. Not because it's a primer or a how-to guide, but because it's an effort to reestablish an emotional connection and to tell people that if you don't have that emotional connection to wine, it's okay. You're not obliged to love it. This is a, a, a choice. It's volition. It's not obligation. And the subtitle of the book is A Memoir and Manifesto. That's more or less the manifesto part, but I wanted to also offer my own experiences falling in love with wine because not because I'm a role model for it, but because it's one way of, of embracing wine, one of many ways. And too often we, we believe in wine that there's only one way of doing things. There's only one proper glass that you should use. There's only one proper wine for one proper food, only one proper wine for one occasion. There's so many variables, and it's so much of it is up or is left really to your own taste and desires. 
So I was just a, a suburban kid growing up in the 70s, and um, I was one of, uh, my parents learned about food through Julia Child, and on a trip to France once as a teenager, they took me along with them, and, and for some reason my mother was very unhappy with me and sent me out with my father who was going to have lunch with some friends in Paris he knew, and they took me to a, a bistro there. And the food, very simple entrecote and arico vert, it's a, a rib steak and green beans, the flavors were so vivid and alive to me, someone who grew up on TV dinners and instant coffee and that sort of thing, that I was determined to, to repeat this experience again and again for the pleasure of it. And I wanted, uh, I eventually got into wine as well as eating, cooking, and just really decided, because I finally tasted wine that was alive, the equivalent of that meal in France, that this was what I was going to do, and I was going to figure out some way to have this experience again and again. And there's one more reason that I wrote the book, and that is because this is, right now, the greatest time in history to, to be a wine lover. We have a greater variety of wine, greater diversity of, of wines from more places in the world, from more different grapes, in more different styles than ever before. And to, to contrast what we have available to us now to what we did 25 years ago when I was really getting into wine is, is it's astounding. You know, back then it was Bordeaux and Burgundy and Champagne and, and everything else. Maybe some Chianti or something like that. Now, great wines from, from places like Sicily, which we always thought of as, as you know, big lakes of rot gut, or, or Slovenia, the entire uh, Eastern Europe, former Soviet republics that were had a wine tradition that was truncated by communism are now coming alive again. Um, little villages in Italy and France and, and Spain that never exported their wines any farther than the, the, the big city up the river are now sending their wines halfway around the world. And it's just happened in the last 25 years. So the idea for me is with so much pleasure available to people, if I could if not eliminate the obstacles that people are facing, at least get people to ask questions about the assumptions we make, about how we're supposed to think about wine and supposed to talk about wine. If I could do that in this book, I would consider it a, a great victory. So that's what I'm after, um, just trying to make the pleasure a little bit more available and the obstacles a little bit lower. Thank you very much for coming, and if I can answer any questions for you, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Anybody? All right. So considering wine is a worldwide drink that people of all um, classes have been drinking throughout history. How has it become the exclusive drink now of our, and, and so difficult to get into, or, or snobbish, as you put it? Why of all of the, uh, <clears throat> the, the food and drink out there has that been the one? Well, you know, wine has, has always been that way in, in this country for several reasons. Um, for one First of all, we don't, or we haven't historically grown up drinking it. Um, unlike wine producing countries, Italy, France, or wherever, it's not, it has not been a daily beverage that people grow up with, people of all classes. Um, in Anglo-Saxon countries, wine has primarily been a, a collectible, uh, first by the aristocracy, and then by a, a rising middle class who had the wherewithal, uh, particularly after World War II and particularly after television and jet travel brought the rest of the world in to learn about these things. But it was something 
we learned about through books and classes. And it was taught, I believe, from a, um, uh, a connoisseur's point of view. And that contributes to the, the snob factor. Um, the other element there is that there's always been a kind of wine lowlife association. You know the term, wino, thunderbird, uh, wine spodioti. You know, these are all, these are um, get drunk quick beverages that have been associated with skid row. And so you have this kind of dual um, thing where it's both the, the beverage of the upper class and the beverage of the lower class. And then you throw in uh, a certain element of puritanism um, and anti-intellectualism because wine is associated with connoisseurship. And you have um, every possible element to feel hostile toward wine and wine drinkers. And that's beginning to change now as more younger people are, are getting into wine. But the ironic thing is that nowadays those historic wine consuming countries are drinking far less wine than they used to. And the, the tradition of having a bottle on the table for every meal, lunch and dinner, is, is falling away. And a lot of kids don't grow up anymore with the, the comfort and familiarity that they once did. So people in France, people in Italy are starting to learn about wine the way Americans have with scores and tasting notes and classes and consumer guides. And so the, the attitude of snobbiness uh, is, is growing in those countries as it's beginning to diminish here. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Um, since wine tasting is so subjective, um, you do critique a lot of wines you know, daily. I'm not sure if you taste wines every single day. How do you try to remain objective in the face of all that as the Times critic for such a huge readership? Um, I think that it's, you know, wine, wine is a funny thing because it's both um, tastes are subjective, but, but quality is more, is more objective. It's not strictly objective because there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of um, critics confuse their own taste with objectivity, uh, which probably happens in, in many other fields as well. Um, but I, I personally feel that there's a lot more to wine than simply the, the taste and, and aromas, as you can gather. Um, to me, good wine is an expression of culture. Um, Wine is, is a product of, of a place and a people. It represents a history. It represents a time. No other beverage can do that. And for me, the, the full appreciation of wine comes not just in, in trying to describe um, you know, the very uh, elusive concept of deliciousness, but also understanding the wine itself in the context of the time and place and, and, and uh, people who produced it. And that's really what, um, for me, helps to understand a, a wine. And the other element is that, that I, I believe in drinking rather than tasting. I think uh, the whole idea of tasting wines, and as you're forced to do as a critic, 75 wines at a time, uh, really distorts the experience because you miss that that evolution of wine in a glass and the interplay with food and the interplay with with the people that you're you're with and I, I try to think of wine in that larger context and to talk about it in a way that that displays those cultural elements and it, it becomes not a question of being objective so much as it becomes a, a question of being observant. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, it's, but it is, when you come down to it, it's still, you still do have all those bottles on the, on the wine shop shelf. And it's such a moving target because not only is a given bottle going to change how it tastes from one moment to the next, 
but that wine, even if you love it, may not taste the same way the next year. It yeah. changes from vintage to vintage. So how do you get a, how do you sort of, it's such a moving target, how do you slow down the target and start identifying stuff you like? Well, I, I think that's a great question, and I think one of the, the wonderful things we've seen in wine over the last 10 years is a decentralization of power, where everybody used to rely on the the leading critics for their scores and tasting notes. And, and even restaurants and wine shops abdicated their own control. They would post those little shelf talkers with the critic's score and, and, and note. And now um, restaurant sommeliers and, and wine shop people are reclaiming the ability to, to curate their own selection and to describe and, and, and recommend their own wines. And, and why not? I, I find that um, sommeliers and wine shop employees, and, and I'm making a distinction now between a good wine shop and a supermarket or just a, you know, an, an indifferent one. But, you know, that's not hard. You know the difference between a, a great book shop and a sort of a, a, an, a, an airport book shop. You know, in a great book shop, you talk to the clerk and you recommend a, a good book on, on, the, um, on Renaissance sculpture or, or, you know, on baseball or whatever. And they are more than happy to, to take you under their wing because they know the selection. They know it intimately and they can make recommendations. Um, you know, we have a, a fear that uh, sommeliers or, or wine shop people are going to rip us off because they're going to they're gonna upsell us. Um, and that's not an, an illegitimate fear, um, but most people are, I don't know if you remember the old uh, independent record shops in the 80s when, when people would be so passionate about the latest musical discovery and they just wanted to turn you on to it. That's the way most people in wine are. So uh, I, I promote a more trusting attitude to people who are closely and intimately associated with the selection and, and stepping back from the, the centralized powers who really don't know much about it other than their quick taste and, and sniff. I, I don't know if this is exactly a follow-up, and I don't know if it's blasphemy, but in, in books and music these days, they have algorithms that say, if you like this kind of music, if you like this singer, you, you may also like this singer. Uh, I don't know if it's blasphemy to talk that way about wine, but to say, if you like this particular vintage, this particular wine, gee, you might also like something like that. Well, uh, you know, the, the strange thing there is that, you know, unlike music or unlike book, books, wines are not fixed, and they change from year to year. And that, that algorithm, it might be useful, but it, it just might be a, a load of horse shit, to be honest. I mean, I've read these things, you know, if you like black coffee then you'll love this wine. And that's, that couldn't, you know, I love black coffee, but I hated that wine they recommended. So, uh, you know, there, there may be formulas that would work uh, to, to suggest something like that. And uh, I would have to see them and know how they work to trust them. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I'm, you might be able to tell, um, you know, I, I don't really believe in a digital approach to, uh, to wine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.